Good day and welcome to the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group's webinar series, Global Initiatives in Science and Practice. The objective of this webinar series is to be held monthly and to provide insight and knowledge about ecological restoration and to provide opportunities for networking and direct engagement. Each month, a different speaker will give a 40-minute presentation on their work, whether on the global, regional, scale, new initiatives, or technical guidance and restoration. They'll be held every third Friday of the month from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, UTC minus 4. We'll have questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please type any questions you have into the chat box. This series is open to all IUCN and CEM members, as well as any restoration enthusiasts and practitioners. We aim to grow participation each month and create a forum to learn and connect with uh, others around the globe. The link to join that's included in your Zoom registration confirmation e email will be the same link that you use for all monthly sessions. All monthly session recordings throughout the year will be found on the Ecosystem Restoration webinar series site. This month, we'll be talking about forest landscape restoration through the IUCN Global Forest Conservation Program, presented by Craig Beatty. Craig Beatty is a program officer for the IUCN Global Forest Conservation Program in Washington, DC. He has helped operationalize the Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology, or ROAM, since 2014. His work includes facilitating the transfer of knowledge, tools, and capacity on the components of forest landscape restoration assessments, and his work especially focuses on geographic analysis of landscape degradation and restoration priorities. He also works to develop the Restoration Opportunities Optimization Tool, which is a decision support tool that enables stakeholders to optimize their investments and in restoration to the benefit of multiple ecosystem services for varied, varied beneficiaries. Uh, so I will hand this off to Craig. Thank you very much for presenting for us today. Uh, so let me share my presentation here. Uh, and we'll get started. I'm going to go for about 40 minutes, hopefully, and then we'll take some time for questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk about the the, the work that the ICE and uh, what is now called, called the Forest Conservation Program, what was formerly called the Global Forest and Climate Change Program. Um, the work that we've been working doing on forest landscape restoration for the past uh, about eight years since since the Bond Challenge and uh, but it goes back much further than that. So um, the, I, the Global Forest Conservation Program essentially develops and supports international and global forest landscape restoration initiatives. Um, and mostly what we've done uh, over the past uh, nine, eight or nine years has been acting as the Secretariat of the Bond Challenge, which drives a lot of our work. Um, so the Forest Conservation Program at IUCN works on, on three business lines. Uh, first, we have uh, forest landscape restoration, we have locally controlled forests, and then we also work on primary forests. And so there are, we have a, a relatively small team um, that's split between uh, Washington, D.C., where we have about 15 people, uh, and then Switzerland at our headquarters just outside of Geneva uh, that has about uh, seven or eight people. And of course, then we work with all of, with many colleagues throughout all of the uh, 50 or so IUCN offices around the world um, on forest landscape restoration. Uh, so the Bond Challenge itself uh, was is a global effort to bring 150 million hectares of degraded and deforested land into restoration by 2020, uh, and this target was uh, upped by 200 million hectares to a total of 350 million hectares by 2030. Uh, uh, through the New York Declaration on Forests. Uh, we, the way that we view the Bond Challenge is that it's a vehicle mostly for domestic priorities. Um, so countries have already uh, priorities that have to do with food security, uh, water and energy security, and rural development. And forest landscape restoration uh, can, can contribute to uh, achieving a lot of those domestic priorities. And the Bond Challenge provides countries with a platform to elevate those priorities to, into an international uh, context. Uh, it is a fully voluntary 
um, process. Countries commit uh, hectares to uh, the principles of forest landscape restoration, uh, and and that. Uh, helps them to achieve all of these conventions that you see here. So later to later in the presentation, I'll talk a bit, little bit about the work, some of the work we've done with the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, but we've also worked with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, UNCCD on land degradation neutrality and the Sustainable Development Goals, among many others. Uh, so the forest landscape restoration has a, a, a wonderful uh, global partnership uh, that. Uh, unites all of these uh, organizations that you see here uh, to restore the world's lost and degraded forests and the landscapes that surround them. Uh, so the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration uh, works to, to define the principles of restoration and to provide global leadership on forest landscape restoration initiatives, including the Bond Challenge. Uh, so uh, the Bond Challenge itself has two major uh, regional initiatives. One is AFR 100, or the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, uh, and that was codified um, for the IUCN Secretariat at the 2016 World Conservation Congress, where a, a motion was passed that turned into Resolution 40 for the Secretariat to support um, forest landscape restoration in Africa. And so the IUCN Secretariat has a specific mandate uh, to support AFR 100, um, and it started out as a country, it still is a country-led effort uh, to bring into restoration 100 million hectares of degraded and deforested land in Africa by 2030, um, and as of today, we're at 113% of that commitment uh, on the continent. So 113 million hectares have so far been committed by, by 28 countries. Um, so the the AFR 100 is led by the African uh, Development uh, Agency, NEPAD, uh, which just stands for a new partnership for African development. Um, and the management team is composed of NEPAD, uh, GIZ, uh, BMZ, uh, both German institutions, IUCN, the World Bank, and the World Resources Institute, along with uh, government representatives from 20 different countries, a diverse set of technical and financial partners. And what AFR 100 is intends to do is to coordinate regional perspectives for restoring degraded and deforested land and landscapes. Um, it deepens the engagement with the regional economic commissions and other partners to make sure that forest landscape restoration uh, contributes both to improving ecological productivity and uh, uh, supporting human livelihoods. Um, uh, it, it, it supports uh, different governance structures and harmonizes with initiatives like Terra Africa and the African Resilient Landscapes Initiative. Um, and uh, every year they hold a uh, technical and high level conferences and, and meetings. I think this year uh, coming up, it'll be in Ghana, um, but they change where it is uh, each year. And uh, they, they outline their priorities for the upcoming year. Uh, I, the IUCN Secretariat last year worked with NEPAD uh, to develop capacity in several different countries in Africa on forest landscape restoration and how to operationalize those commitments to AFR 100, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. So the other main uh, global initiative is Initiative 20 by 20, and this has been going on a little bit longer um, and covers all the, all the countries that you can see here. Uh, it was originally intended to bring 20 million hectares of degraded and deforested land uh, under restoration by 2020. Um, there are now 50 million hectares across Latin America that have been committed um, to, for the, to the principles of forest landscape restoration, um, including uh, lots of capital committed by the private sector to make sure uh, that, that this happens. So like AFR 100, there are technical and financial partners. Um, you can see in the middle here underneath 20 by 20, there are many different um, organizations and countries. So um, essentially what, we're, what uh, 20 by 20 is looking for is commitments uh, to the principles of forest landscape restoration from organizations or uh, countries uh, or government uh, agencies or, or state agencies that uh, are interested in forest landscape restoration and see the benefits uh, for all the, all, the, all the ways that, that uh, they, they go. Uh, so 
what we do at the IUCN Forest Conservation Program is we generate and we support interest in forest landscape restoration, and that's through these regional initiatives. Um, that's through securing commitments to the bond challenge at a high level. Um, that in, uh, includes um, organizing ministerial roundtables, which we've done for many years in Africa, uh, Asia. We just started one in Central Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, and then uh, what we want to do uh, is to not only uh, encourage countries to uh, uh, countries and, and those with the rights to manage land uh, to to commit to forest landscape restoration, but we'd like to help to them to track those commitments. Um, and so, we'll, in many of the many of the much of the work that we do, uh, we take forest landscape restoration assessments, uh, and then we. Spell out how the how restoration might contribute, uh, or how um, the process of, of arranging stakeholders and talking about restoration even uh, can contribute to uh, the IEG targets under the CBD um, or nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement for the Convention on Climate Change, and so on and so forth. And these ministerial roundtables um, happen probably every year um, in at, in at least one part of the world. Um, and what they do is they build high-level political commitment uh, to forest landscape restoration that then can then uh, uh, trickle down uh, in many cases to to um, the operationalization uh, of forest landscape restoration commitments. Uh, so this is where we are in the bond challenge today. Uh, we have 58 commitments that cover 170 million hectares um, in all of these countries. Uh, the most recent one was Zimbabwe, which committed 2 million hectares earlier this year or late last year. Um, or, uh, Zimbabwe and Scotland, which was our first uh, commitment from, from uh, Europe. Um, also new to the scene uh, is the Caucasus in Central Asia, and they're pretty small, but you can see Georgia and, and Armenia have committed, as well as uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and uh, the Kyrgyz Republic. Um, the, you'll see a few of them on here um, uh, are commitments to 20 by 20 or AFR 100 and they're not uh, indicated as bond challenge commitments uh, and some of that has to do with, um, uh, for instance, Paraguay has committed to 20 by 20 but they haven't included a, a number of hectares uh, that they're committed uh, that they've committed to the bond challenge so while we recognize their commitment to forest landscape restoration um, uh, we were looking to make for, for Paraguay and, and the other countries here, uh, some of them to uh, make hectare commitments. And in other cases, there are just some, uh, some administrative issues with, with, uh, with that. Uh, but you can see across the world, um, the commitments to the bond challenge have, have really ramped up. I'll say that in the first commitment was for Rwanda. And that happened uh, right after the bond challenge was initiated in 2011, and Rwanda committed two million hectares to the bond challenge. Um, and their, the, Rwanda's land area is is 2.2 million hectares. So essentially, they committed they committed the entire land surface of, of Rwanda to the principles of forest landscape restoration, which they're now implementing right uh, currently. Uh, so I mentioned tracking the bond challenge commitments, and one of the one of the the main projects that we have at the, at the Forest Conservation Program is the Bond Challenge Barometer. Um, and we've just finished, um, or we're just finishing up um, a trial run of six different countries uh, to pilot the Bond Challenge Barometer. And what this does is it, it's a system that allows countries to track um, the, their commitments to the Bond Challenge. Uh, so what it is, uh, is it accommodates a wide range of of uh, those bond challenge pledge contacts. Each country um, comes at forest landscape restoration in a little bit of a different way with different objectives. Um, it, it looks at uh, the, the country circumstances and the capabilities for reporting. Um, and then uh, the accuracy and the credibility of those responses is categorized into different tiers uh, based on, on how com confident we are in that information or how confident uh, governments are in reporting that information. What we hope to do through the barometer is to minimize the burden and effort that's required for reporting uh, or tracking bond challenge uh, commitments. So we'd like for the indicators that we use in the, in the barometer uh, 
to align with other reporting commitments that countries have uh, that link to existing monitoring systems for landscapes uh, and uh, we can provide detailed guidance uh, where possible here. So, and then finally, uh, uh, the barometer identifies the progress on forest landscape restoration uh, and gaps and, and places where improvements can be made. And so um, it's intended to be used by governments or bond challenge focal points um, and, and has been uh, pretty good so far at doing that. Uh, let's see here, next. Okay, so this is, this is, these are the, the criteria that the barometer uses. It has success factors, on policy and financial flows um, and the technical underpinning of restoration planning and monitoring and evaluation. Most of the work that I do at, uh, for, the, uh, for the program is on restoration planning and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the, the information that countries would be reporting on are hectares under restoration, the climate impacts of uh, the restoration transitions uh, that have taken place, uh, any biodiversity impacts, and then uh, importantly also socioeconomic impacts. So the number of jobs created uh, through forest landscape restoration, and this has been specifically important um, in the United States, which made a 15 million hectare commitment to the Bond Challenge very early on. Um, they uh, are, have, have done a fantastic job of, of keeping track of the economic impacts of their collaborative forest landscape restoration program um, and to, to report on the number of jobs and the, the support for a rural economy, um, especially that the, the forest landscape restoration program has created. And uh, so if you're interested in that, you can go to InfoFLR and the barometer is, is up on the webpage. Um, and, and you can see here that uh, the barometer tracks policies and institutions, financial flows um, and all of these all of these tabs at the bottom but really it gives a very a broad overview of, of progress um, uh, underneath uh, for each of the the bond challenge commitments so I'd encourage you to go and and play around with that um, and it also uh, uh, tends it also tracks uh, the, the cons uh, hectares under restoration that occur in conservation priority areas like key biodiversity areas and, and areas like that. Uh, so maybe I'll just shift gears a second to talk about the principles of forest landscape restoration because it's something that comes up all the time. Um, and there was even a, a, there's a nature article that came out um, a couple of weeks ago that talked about the Bond Challenge and forest landscape restoration. And I think that there's a, a lot of times a misconception that forest landscape restoration is forest restoration. Um, and uh, what we do in forest landscape restoration is to look at forests as components of functional landscapes. And so the Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration has come up with seven principles uh, of forest landscape restoration. And when countries commit to the Bond Challenge, they commit to uh, these seven principles of forest landscape restoration. So um, in implementing their their forest landscape restoration commitments, countries uh, commit to manage for long-term landscape resilience. Um, they commit to looking at landscape restoration uh, that allows for multiple benefits, for eco ecological benefits, social benefits, and economic benefits. Um, forest landscape restoration needs to be tailored to local conditions. Um, so as we look at uh, forest landscape restoration activities that work and try and scale them up, we always need to be aware uh, that restoration happens at always at a local scale and uh, should be tailored to local conditions. Um, uh, forest landscape restoration needs to involve a broad group of stakeholders, hopefully as many stakeholders as is possible, um, who are inter interacting with the landscapes uh, that are under assessment or restoration. Um, also, the forest landscape restoration does focus on landscapes. It is not site-based. Um, so uh, the, the uh, forest landscape restoration activities that would take place at specific sites form components of much larger landscapes uh, that, that uh, are the, are the uh, what the, the, the scale that we're, that we're looking to, to work at. Um, forest landscape restoration looks to restore functionality, and that's functionality, both ecological functionality, uh, as well as um, social and economic functionality. Uh, and then importantly, forest landscape restoration needs to maintain 
uh, natural ecosystems. Uh, so with all of these components, um, countries agreed to make uh, a commitment to forest landscape restoration for however many hectares, uh, and then um, uh, go forward and, and work on it. But uh, forest landscape restoration is not just about planting trees. Um, we plant, uh, planting trees is certainly a component of it, and, and uh, lots of countries uh, have different kinds of, of tree planting situations, including plantations, agroforestry, uh, lots of different interventions with planting trees, but this is a, a component of a broader landscape strategy. Uh, forest landscape restoration is also not about forest restoration, uh, not only about forest restoration. Forest restoration uh, is certainly an important part of uh, building functional landscapes, uh, but FLR is not focused only on forest restoration. Uh, so what we're looking to do is to look at landscapes uh, and find solutions to all, a lot of the problems uh, that exist in landscapes. So we like to use forest landscape restoration to do things like provide clean water or stable sources of clean water to uh, uh, store and capture uh, carbon to improve biodiversity or food security and all of these, all of these things here. So uh, there are of course, looking at uh, the production of, of ecosystem services, um, uh, uh, provisioning services like timber products and non-timber forest products, uh, and then and then all all sorts of all of the sorts of things uh, that landscapes bring. But when we talk about forest landscape restoration at IUCN, our entry point is always degradation. So when we're looking at a landscape, uh, we work with stakeholders to find. Uh, what, what are the components of degradation uh, that are really affecting the landscape? And so we get things like this, unstable soil erosion or gullying, illegal logging, water sedimentation or a lack of water flow, declining crop yields and monocropping is a very big one, or forest clearing for agriculture. Uh, all of these uh, components of degradation we tend to look at uh, at a landscape uh, or site scale uh, and to just to see what the entry point is for degradation, and that's going to be different for all of the all of the places that we go, um, and with different combinations. So then we try and look at what are the opportunities um, for addressing that degradation. So if we have unstable soil uh, erosion and gullying, what we hope well, the opportunity is that through forest landscape restoration, we would we would uh, use uh, different interventions to restore stable and rich soils. Uh, if we're looking at declining crop yields and monocropping, um, uh, what we have an opportunity to do here is provide uh, increased food security and nutrition uh, and so on uh, across the landscape. So each one of these types of degradation uh, has an opportunity that's attached to it. Uh, what we then do is, is to design uh, forest landscape restoration intervention strategies uh, that respond to both the objectives of forest landscape restoration defined by the stakeholders and um, uh, the, the drivers of degradation. So what we're really trying to do through forest landscape restoration is to not just uh, use uh, restoration interventions uh, to restore degraded areas, uh, but to try through a broad stakeholder process to address the reasons why those landscapes are de degraded in the first place. And a lot of times that takes us from the biophysical components of, of degradation uh, and, and deforestation into the social and economic realm of why landscapes are continually being degraded. And so what we try and do uh, is work with uh, members and stakeholders and partners uh, to build broad coalitions to address those drivers of degradation at, at, at the scale of, of uh, whatever scale we're working at. Um, so like I said, forest landscape restoration is not site-based. We might find uh, in, in, a, in an area like this uh, that these are, these are the, the uh, types of degradation and, and uh, uh, solutions or interventions that would be appropriate. But forest landscape restoration is not focused on sites. So each one of the sites that you would look at would differ in the composition or the degree of degradation. They would differ in their economic objectives and potential, uh, and they would differ in the costs of restoration and how stakeholders would like to achieve 
uh, their own FLR objectives. So since forest landscape restoration is always a local exercise, we need to keep in mind uh, that we uh, land, uh, that although uh, forest landscape restoration and restoration always takes place at a local scale, um, uh, how can we how can we scale that up uh, in in our approaches? Uh, so what I and the Secretariat does is we work to convene uh, groups of stakeholders that are representative of of the landscapes in which we're working. And so if we're looking at a district scale, which we've done in many cases, um, we'll look at the social and the economic and the environmental objectives of different stakeholders uh, within that district. We can also scale up to provincial or the next administrative level. And when we scale up to that level, um, we'll get different social, economic, and environmental objectives a lot of the times. Uh, or the way that they are addressed ends up being different because the scale has changed. And then a lot of the times we work at national scale. So looking at laws and institutions and, and policies that drive how people utilize landscapes um, and then uh, assessing the opportunities for addressing those uh, uh, gaps or shortfalls or, or, or recognizing the successes. Uh, so what, the, what we do with the Secretariat for Forest Landscape Restoration, and I think this is probably the bulk of the work that we do, is we support and we facilitate capacity development and stakeholder engagement and technical assessments of FLR opportunities at local scales. Uh, and we do the same thing at national and subnational scales. And so what we're trying to do is work both on a, at, a, at a very high national or international policy level to build broad support for forest landscape restoration and the multiple benefits that it can achieve, as well as developing capacity and supporting the people that actually have to do the restoration at the local scale. So to do that, uh, we use something called the Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology. Uh, like Brock mentioned, uh, I, I, I started with IUCN in 2013, uh, and this was published in 2014. So since it started, I've been working on Rome. Uh, and what it is, is it's a stepwise and iterative, uh, flexible and adaptable, adaptable framework um, that brings people together to identify negotiate and implement uh, forest landscape restoration activities. Um, so uh, it generates a lot of information and uh, of data uh, and, and it's intended to, pro to provide a decision context uh, for those working on forest landscape restoration. Uh, so it's, it ends up providing a lot of maps and data and cost benefit analysis and, and carbon abatement and all sorts of technical things. Um, but it's intended uh, as a decision support tool. So uh, it operationalizes on challenge commitments a lot of the time, um, and it is demand driven. And so when, uh, when a group of stakeholders comes together to assess the opportunities for restoration through Rome, um, the, it's, that, it's that platform that ends up uh, having ownership over the process um, and, and, and eventually uh, putting together a strategy uh, for forest landscape restoration. So Rome answers, uh, these are eight questions, it probably answers way more than this, um, but it, it helps uh, stakeholders to answer, answer the question of where restoration is feasible, uh, socially, economically, and ecologically. Um, what is the extent of restoration opportunities in the country? Many people might be familiar with the World of Opportunities map. Um, uh, what, what Rome, I think does uh, very well uh, is it defines what the what opportunities exist for restoration at whatever scale it's operating. So at the global scale, you'll have a much different analysis um, than when you really get down and start talking to national or subnational level stakeholders about what their objectives for restoration are and what their drivers of degradation are. Um, it looks at what types of restoration are feasible in different parts of the country uh, for different reasons. Uh, it estimates the costs and the benefits of that restoration, including carbon storage, ecosystem services, uh, and the costs and benefits associated with different restoration strategies. I'll say that it also um, includes, uh, it makes sure that the, the, the forest landscape restoration strategies uh, that result from the assessment can be as gender responsive as possible so that the benefits that flow or the costs that are, are, are incurred 
by those uh, participating in forest landscape restoration uh, are shared equ as equitably as possible between uh, men and women and, and other uh, maybe disadvantaged groups. Uh, it looks at the policy, financial, and social incentives uh, to support restoration. So what are the enabling conditions that exist um, uh, with, with policy, uh, with, with budgets that are available, and uh, different cultural or social incentives for restoration or, or degradation. It, it, it's, it importantly looks at the stakeholders uh, that need to be engaged, um, and that will differ based on the scale. Uh, it looks at what options to unlock financing, and then of course how to scale it up. Uh, so these are a few of the key components. I think I went through most of them. Uh, the work that I specifically do uh, is on drivers of degradation, FLR opportunities, priorities, and transitions, and then a lot of spatial data analysis uh, and ecosystem service analysis. Uh, yeah, but uh, these are these are nine of, of nine of the key uh, components of Rome here. So this is, uh, these are all the places where we've done Rome so far or are doing Rome. To date, Rome has assessed over 450 million hectares of land area um, and has identified uh, over 160 million hectares of forest landscape restoration opportunities in 26 different countries. Um, we have 12 Romes going on right now that are just starting in, uh, we have uh, in uh, Mani River Union, which is Sierra Leone, Guinea, uh, Liberia, and Cote d'Ivoire. There's one in Togo, in Madagascar, um, in Southern Ethiopia, uh, and then a few others, uh, Argentina, and, and a few others, like in Belize, uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but Rome continues to be uh, uh, demand-driven, uh, and the demand exists. So when Rome was first published, uh, if you look in the in the in the, the road test manual, which was published in 2014, uh, that had four four roams that were um, not totally complete. Uh, and since then, we've gone from four to 38 uh, in in like five years. Um, so there's been a lot of demand. Um, uh, uh, some of these some of these countries, like uh, Brazil, has not done a national roam. They have five or six. Uh, state level of Rome's, but just for making an easy map to read, I've included the whole country. DRC is the same. There's been a small Rome um, in one of the landscapes in DRC, certainly not for the whole country. So they can be uh, subnational or national, um, but uh, they're out there, certainly. All right, so uh, forest landscape restoration is not a single type of restoration on the ground. Uh, importantly, it uses a suite of interventions that work together throughout a landscape to address the drivers of degradation uh, and de deliver increased ecological productivity and human well-being. And so we work at the Secretariat to make sure that uh, that, that diversity in approaches uh, is something that goes into all of these assessments. So we spend a lot of time, uh, I spend most of my time working on uh, assessments with the restoration opportunities assessment methodology. So this is an example from Malawi um, and part of the spatial data analysis that we went through and did uh, to look at, this is Malawi's, what ended up as Malawi's map of degradation. And so in this process, what we did was to work with the stakeholder and mapping uh, and work uh, mapping uh, group uh, to identify the, the most important components of degradation uh, that would need to be addressed uh, in their forest landscape restoration strategy. And so they came up with nine different uh, uh, priority uh, components of degradation here. Um, and then we stack them on top of each other to see where they overlap more or less. And so the darker areas here um, mean that more of these criteria overlap with each other. And the idea is that that might confer uh, some uh, information on the degree of degradation in those areas. Um, this doesn't necessarily match up with priority, um, since priority is something that's uh, defined more by, as, a, as a process um, than, than, than as an analytical output. Um, this is another example of one of the outputs from Rome from Mexico. Uh, they've spent a very long time in Mexico going through very uh, detailed economic models. Um, this is, I think, one of 26 or 25 or 30 different economic models developed by 
um, the uh, stakeholder platform that looks at a su successional agroforestry system for the peninsula Yucatan. Uh, and so you'll see in the first three years, um, there are uh, uh, perennial crops that uh, contribute squash and banana, and uh, then further on from the fourth year, mahogany and mango take over. And, and what was key in this uh, here was that um, cash flow wasn't interrupted. So uh, working with, with smallholders in Peninsula Yucatan, uh, the year-to-year -year cash flow was the most important thing for farmers. And so in designing forest landscape restoration strategies, uh, they had to make sure that cash continued to flow. Um, and the result of this working, oh, the result of this working with the Mexican government uh, was that uh, agricultural subsidies uh, that were uh, provided previously for any kind of agriculture, I'm, I understand, have now been diverted, a certain uh, percentage has been diverted to support the implementation of these forest landscape restoration uh, strategies on degraded and deforested land uh, in Peninsula Yucatan. Uh, so this is another example from uh, Espirito Santo in Brazil. So we did a state level assessment there, um, and uh, this uh, was, uh, uh, one of the outputs of that is that uh, in, in the state, uh, they wanted to look at vegetation buffers along contours. Um, they wanted to use forest landscape restoration to protect wetlands and springs, uh, tree plantings to protect uh, from runoff on roads. Uh, and then uh, these are three of three of many um, interventions that would be uh, selected to uh, improve uh, the functionality of, of landscapes. And, and lots of Latin America, uh, the focus has been on degraded pasture land. Um, a lot of tropical forest uh, has been cleared for pasture. Uh, and so there's a lot of focus on silvo pastoral systems. Uh, and just one example of the, uh, the impacts that this restoration can have uh, is uh, in, in this instance, um, on this pasture, uh, the, the, they originally had uh, 1.2 heads of cattle per hectare, producing 1.7 liters of milk per day. Um, and after uh, forest landscape restoration, silo pastoral interventions, um, that they could uh, farmers could increase the number of heads of cattle per hectare to 5.1 uh, and produce 4.1 liters of milk per day. So that's a very significant increase um, from uh, a forest landscape restoration intervention in that specific case. So uh, maybe to, to jump here uh, to to. Uh, how we connect with uh, forest landscape restoration with the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is something that we've worked on for several years. Um, with our first information document that we submitted on FLR was at the uh, CBD uh, Conference of Parties in, in Cancun in 2016. And it was a, it was a pre, uh, we looked through all of the restoration opportunities assessments that we did uh, and started to match them up with the different IHU targets. And so uh, for the last COP in Sharm el Sheikh uh, last year, we developed a, an updated information document that looks at how biodiversity commitments can be accelerated through forest landscape restoration. And so what we did was we looked at all of the 26 uh, roams uh, that, that we had at the time. At the end of 2018, we had 26 that were completed. Uh, and we looked through those to, to see uh, how those forest landscape restoration strategies or the assessments that were undertaken contributed to the different IHE targets. Um, so, uh, and what we found was that uh, FLR is linked uh, to all of the IHE targets. So uh, all of them, uh, the work on forest landscape restoration contributes both in uh, the, the process related targets. Uh, so targets like target two, which, uh, 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 unites people uh, around around uh, uh, social, economic, and and biophysical. The data needed to uh, integrate biodiversity conservation at large scales, um, as well as uh, target five, seven, eleven, and then typical ones that have to do with forest landscape restoration. Uh, so, if you're interested in reading how exactly forest landscape restoration uh, helps accelerate. Uh, or achieve those targets, uh, you're welcome to, to click on this link when we get the presentation out to you, uh, or just let me know. Uh, also, we've developed full biodiversity guidelines for 
uh, forest landscape restoration opportunities assessments. Uh, so like I said, Rome was developed in 2014. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, we have uh, learned a lot. So since 2014, we've learned a lot about forest landscape restoration, uh, how assessments are implemented, how stakeholders work together. Uh, and one of the things that we thought could use a little bit, could be explained a little bit more explicitly uh, was how to incorporate biodiversity information into those assessments. Uh, and so we developed biodiversity guidelines uh, to help forest landscape restoration practitioners find and utilize biodiversity data in those assessments uh, so that biodiversity can be a ex more explicitly uh, stated component of those assessments. And we've done the same thing. Uh, for gender. So there are also gender, uh, there's a guidelines for gender responsive approaches to forest landscape restoration assessments that are available as well. Uh, and there are several other um, uh, additions that we'd like to make to that road test edition of Rome. So going forward, um, I think uh, what we hope to do is both uh, to look at uh, uh, what we're doing right now is searching for funding uh, to maybe uh, do a wider consultation on these biodiversity guidelines. This was something that was written just by just by our program and by the Secretariat uh, with support by UK Aid and uh, Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment. Uh, what we'd like to do is to find some funding to, to uh, create a broader consultation process for these biodiversity guidelines that of course would include uh, Commission on Ecosystem Management and the Species Survival Commission, uh, as well as other uh, member and uh, interested organizations. Uh, and so uh, we're looking uh, for that as well. Um, and then uh, finally, I guess I'll say uh, that there's, there's lots of opportunities, I think, uh, for the IUCN Secretariat uh, and the Commission on Ecosystem Management, especially the thematic group uh, on ecosystem restoration, uh, to start writing together. So uh, I think we can work, work with the commission. Uh, you are all experts in ecosystem restoration. Uh, and I think that uh, going forward, uh, your consultation uh, on, on second drafts of these documents uh, will be very, very important. Uh, we are also in the process of looking for funding to um, provide an updated version of Rome. So like I said, uh, it was a road test edition that was published in 2014, and we have learned so much uh, through, all, through all of these assessments. And so what we'd like to do is to, to update that document and to provide a new, uh, new version of Rome uh, that also uh, goes through a, a very uh, substantial and, and quick, uh, hopefully quick, but a uh, very substantial uh, consultation process with all of the people who are interested in the process, which over the years has been many, many more. So uh, I think maybe I'll stop there and uh, we can take some questions. Uh, I Thanks all for the opportunity again, uh, Brock and Kara, and uh, I, I'm interested to hear uh, some of the great questions that, that people might have. So uh, maybe let's, uh, I'll look at the the, um, the chat box here if I can find it. Thank you very much, Craig. And uh, yeah, please, if you have any questions for Craig, please type them into the chat and we will read them aloud and then answer them if we can. So we'll give you a, a moment as you start typing in and we can get into that. And hopefully, Craig, you can see the chat. Uh, so anything that comes in and you want to address, please feel free. Oh, Eric, I see. Uh, can we adapt these guidelines for mangroves too? That's Patrick Jasper. So yeah, one of the when I mentioned one of the things uh, that we're moving into is also looking at mangroves. And so there was a discussion. Uh, I think that there's a, a specific version of Rome uh, that's being developed for drylands with our IUCN School of Drylands program. And there is also talk about developing a specific one for mangroves. Um, my my view is that the process of Rome itself is independent uh, or agnostic to the type of ecosystem that you're looking at. So uh, we focus more on how, how uh, 
the process of, of assessing opportunities. And so I think that uh, mangroves fit into that process as well as any other ecosystem type. Um, so uh, I, I think there has been a little, there's some, we, uh, part of our team works on something called the Global Mangrove Alliance. Um, and there has been some discussion about developing a, a Rome uh, handbook specifically for mangroves, uh, but I don't know that it's something that's that's has grown legs yet. Um, and and my view would be uh, that uh, Rome, uh, as a process itself, uh, can be is is agnostic to the the, the, the ecosystem that you're talking about. So uh, let's see. How many hectares from the 107, this is from Rosa Ortiz. Uh, how many hectares from the 170 million hectares are covered by large scale plantations? So this is a good question that I don't specifically know the answer to. Um, when you say how of the 170 million hectares, when, when you're talking about that, I, I think maybe you're asking about um, the 160 million hectares of restoration opportunity. Um, I don't have a specific number of, of hectares for plantations, although some countries are more interested in plantations than others. Um, I would say that there's a lot of discussion uh, regarding uh, plantations as a component of forest landscape restoration or countries using uh, commitments to restoration uh, to restoration that it's essentially just a, a way to um, uh, justify large-scale plantations. I would say for forest landscape restoration, um, if the if we're thinking about the, the principles of forest landscape restoration that we work under, um, large-scale plantations may be a component of a broad landscape uh, uh, that are appropriate. In, in some cases, plantations may be a very good option. Um, but our view would be that uh, no one intervention uh, should cover a landscape. And so what we'll focus on is on promoting a diversity of approaches, a diversity of, of intervention types that satisfy multiple needs of multiple stakeholders across a landscape. And I would say that if plantations are the only thing that are existing in a landscape that does not uh, satisfy those criteria. I can read the next questions from Consuelo Bonfil. Okay, thanks. And it says, I've seen before a presentation of the work that has been done in Quintana Roo, Mexico, but some disagreement arised because they were considering palm oil plantations in their count of restored lands, claiming that they reduced their area and were going to make it more diverse. The academic community did not agree. What is your position about uh, this kind of activity? Yeah, I would say, um, I don't know the specific context for Quintana Roo, um, but certainly palm oil plantations, uh, sugar, uh, there's, there are lots of commodities um, that are components of landscapes. Um, I, I don't know that I would take a specific position not knowing uh, the, the, the details there. Um, but I would say that um, what, if, what if palm oil plantations, so when we look at forest landscape restoration opportunities, what we're trying to do is increase ecological productivity and enhance human uh, well-being. And so if, if there's a land, so the interventions that we choose under forest landscape restoration strategies need to contribute to that. And so if there's a, if, if they're not increasing ecological productivity or it's a large uh, oil palm plantation that's, that's uh, clearing forest uh, in the name of restoration, I would say that that's definitely not in line. Uh, and uh, ISN's position would be that that does not count as forest landscape restoration. That said, um, there are, you know, we're working in West Africa right now uh, on uh, uh, four different uh, uh, forest landscapes actually uh, around Liberia where palm oil is a native species. Um, and uh, the, the view is that uh, palm oil plantations will be a, a, an integral component of the economic activities on those landscapes. And so where farmland has been incredibly degraded, uh, oil plantations might be a, a reasonable component of a forest landscape restoration strategy. 
Okay, the next question is about practices in restoration in Latin America and whether your program has systematized what is good practice. So uh, we don't specifically put standards in for what is good practice and what is not good practice. Um, mostly, uh, so there's a, there's a big discussion in CARE, you know, uh, about the standards for forest landscape restoration. Um, and the world that we work in uh, at IUCN, uh, you'll, you've seen, uh, is throughout many different continents. And so the, the ways that uh, forest landscape restoration is implemented uh, is different in each one of those contexts. Even the way that we're, it's assessed is different. So every roam that we do is different um, and for different reasons. I think um, from our perspective, the, this, the principles of FLR uh, act for us as the guidelines for what, uh, what counts as forest landscape restoration. For specific interventions or specific practices for FLR, um, this would really come down to the type of assessment that, that, that was done. Uh, uh, so I think that at, at ICN's, from ICN's perspective, it's difficult for us uh, to think of standards that would apply uh, across the world uh, that aren't already uh, included in the FLR principles that we follow. Okay, we have a compliment on the methodology and then a question. In terms of forest restoration, which tree species, indigenous, exotic, should be priority species? Sometimes exotic species like acacia perform better in heavily degraded soils in the tropics. Expecting your suggestive guidelines. Yeah, no, so this is a very good point. So uh, well, one of the things that we, as IUCN and as, as uh, what we would love to see is uh, forest landscape restoration that used uh, native species or indigenous tree species, or not even tree species, just you know any species, uh, but that we support uh, ecosystems and biodiversity and landscapes. Uh, and that's certainly a, a large part of, of what we do. Um, but the fact is, that you're right. Uh, in heavily degraded areas, sometimes exotic species perform better. Uh, and and the, uh, what we're trying to do through forest landscape restoration is a long-term iterative process. So if you have a really degraded area uh, where hardly anything will grow, um, uh, maybe it makes sense to plant acacia to start out with in part as part of a successional plan to building the ecological productivity of that of that. Uh, area. Uh, so the, this comes up a lot actually when we talk about eucalyptus uh, because eucalyptus uh, is used everywhere. When we go and we work uh, in, in Africa for instance, um, eucalyptus is the go-to species for, for planting, for restoration, and that's not going to change. No, nothing that we're going to do is going to stop eucalyptus from being used in the landscape because it grows fast, it's easy to take care of, and for the last 50 years, people have been using it very, very well. So eucalyptus is not going anywhere. Uh, what we need to do is to design strategies that support uh, people continuing to use a species that they're comfortable with using, uh, as well as starting to integrate more and more native and indigenous species. And so that's what we're trying to do now uh, but a lot of the a lot of the bottleneck for that is the fact that um, so for instance uh, national uh, nurseries in a lot of countries only grow pine and eucalyptus uh, and so what we have to do is work with uh, institutions like Botanical Gardens Conservation International uh, or or uh, governments or or uh, herbarium or herbaria uh, to make sure that we can start to integrate more seeds and seedlings from many different species, including species listed on the red list, into forest landscape restoration strategies. So what we're end up gonna end up doing is recognizing that in degraded landscapes uh, and, and in, in places all over the world, those exotic species are not going anywhere and they're very useful for people, but starting to build the capacity to improve restoration through using more and more native uh, and indigenous species? That was a very good question. Thank you. So Mohammed asked a 
a follow-up, but I think you addressed it further to previous queries. So should we consider planting exotic tree species if it can contribute better to restoring degraded soils? So you, you can consider it, but also you need to consider the fact that you need to look at the invasive potential of that species, right? So there are lots of exotic species out there that, have, that aren't invasive. Um, but when you, you're designing forest landscape restoration strategies, um, the ecology of that species is something that you definitely need to pay attention to. So, for instance, in uh, lots of places in the world, they uh, planted Prosopis, or I think it's a, a species of mesquite, um, that, uh, for, for wood. Uh, but now it's an incredibly invasive species that they just cannot get rid of. Um, we had a project in Namibia where they just were trying for years uh, on a very small area to just get rid of these prosopis uh, trees that were sucking up all the water and they were not able to do it. So I would say that exotic species uh, do sometimes perform better in degraded areas, but your restoration plan certainly needs to take into consideration the ecology of those species uh, as well as the, the, the benefits that you might expect from that, that restoration intervention. Okay. Shifting um, just like the Himalayas, major hydraulic power plants and tourism practices are the major threats. The stakeholders are doing those things themselves. What kind of restoration strategies can we plan? Is it too hard to implement? Uh, so let's see. Uh, uh, hydraulic, hydrological uh, power plants. Uh, uh, a lot of times when, so they come up a lot of times in our realm assessments um, as uh, opportunities. So uh, a lot of the times when we're looking at the components of degradation, one of the things that comes up a lot is sedimentation in streams. And this was the case in, in especially in Malawi and Rwanda. Um, and, and so those, and, 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 in, and in Colombia as well, uh, those companies exist in the landscapes that we're working. Um, and, and so uh, if the power plants are there, um, I think it might, might be a different story than if they're under construction or proposed. Um, if they're there, then through, our, through ecosystem service analysis, we've been able to draw a direct line between the, the forest landscape restoration and the cost to power companies of replacing their turbines when the water is all mucked up, uh, or the cost of dredging reservoirs. Um, and so we can provide a very discrete uh, economic valuation of how much you could invest in restoring your landscapes to reduce uh, sedimentation and how much the, the consequences are for them as a company in terms of replacing equipment uh, or inefficiencies in producing power. Uh, I think the tourism question um, uh, is, is a little bit different. Um, no, I, don't, I don't recall a, a specific case where tourism played a huge role in forest landscape restoration. I think most of what we're focused on is um, the, the agricultural uh, and land use components, although uh, there have been components of tourism as, as kind of a, a co-benefit, if I can use uh, that term, uh, from forest landscape restoration. Um, I think you can look at them in terms of threats or you can look at them in terms of economic activities uh, that uh, are, are uh, affected negatively by degradation. Uh, and so what we would try and do in those situations is bring together the stakeholders that represent those industries into the assessment process so that they can see uh, that the degradation that we're seeing in terms of uh, uh, forest degradation or agricultural productivity degradation or all sorts of components, uh, they can be addressed through forest landscape restoration for those multiple benefits that we're talking about. But um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, I'll turn it over to Brock to close us out. For this one and all future webinar sessions, we will have it posted on the webinar series webpage, uh, which included all the communications, but I also put in the chat a little bit earlier.
And um, I also want to mention of the of those who who visited with us today, uh, we had people from uh, the U.S., India, Bangladesh, Mexico. They're working in Chile, California, North Dakota, Montana, uh, and a couple other places due to the questions that you saw here today. Um, so um, please keep tuning in. If you can't make it, I'll make the video available within a week so you can always catch up on, on, on the insight that we, we provide. Next month will be um, uh, May 17th, where we'll get some technical guidance on traditional knowledge and ecological restoration provided by Mercedes Concepcion or Dio Ruiz from Chiapas University of the Science and Arts. Thank you very much with that. I think we'll close it out here. And once again, thank you very much for your time here today, Craig. I think they uh, gained a lot of great information from you today. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Yeah.